So first of all, for those of you who are out there in television land, thank you so much for being with us this morning. We appreciate you. Uh, there are folks who watch us on YouTube. I, I can't imagine us being on YouTube, but that's, that's a totally new concept for me. But there are folks who watch this class on YouTube who are way away from us in other parts of the country. So for everyone who watches, thank you so much. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be blessing you and giving you a greater revelation of who this God is. Amen. <clears throat> Isn't that the essence of what this study is about in every study that we have? Who is our God? And we're growing in the knowledge of him. So hopefully that's what's happening. So this morning... We're continuing to discuss this issue of pruning. You remember that when Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches, then in verse 2, he says something that on the surface of it, at least as to our general way of defining and interpreting words, he says, you know, you're supposed to bear more fruit. And the way that happens is that you're going to be pruned. That's a paraphrase of verse 2. And so I asked last week and I ask again. In our general understanding of the word prune, how many of you are excited to know that God is going to prune us in order to create in us, develop in us, grow in us a larger production, if you would, a larger revelation of fruit. How many, this is so exciting. I'm going to be pruned. I'm going to be pruned. And you remember what that fruit is. The essential fruit of the branch is the life that first exists in the vine. We do see that. It's not separate. So Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. So the fruit that God is after in our life is the revelation of his son. And in order for that fruit to be developed and to grow, to be greatly, more greatly manifested, more consistent, we have to be pruned. So last week we talked about the meaning of pruning. What does prune mean? Pruning means, AJ, I'm talking about prunes this morning. AJ brought a, a distinction. Of, this is only AJ could do this about prunes. No, AJ thinks that way. Uh, pruning means to clean, to cleanse. To purify. AJ apparently has a lot of experience in this. And so first of all, let's remember when we talk about, when, when Jesus talked about us needing to be pruned. It has to do with keeping us clean as to our daily relationship and fellowship with him by the Holy Spirit. You remember the text that we referred to last week that has to do with the daily cleaning of our feet. You remember where, where that is? In John chapter what? 13. 13. Jesus and the disciples are together and at the end of the meal Jesus gets, gets up and does the most surprising I don't know what word and I can't find my word right now most awful, amazing, let's say, work. He takes a towel, he takes a basin, and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Remember, Peter said, no, not, no, no, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me. So then, of course, the apostle says, okay, wash everything. And Jesus said, look, you don't need to be washed all over because you have been made clean by the word that I have spoken. In other words, these are men who are God's people saved in the same way we are saved. 
correct? They're saved. Now you say, well, they haven't been saved yet because Jesus hasn't died. No, Jesus is talking about the reality of what will happen after his resurrection as they have received him now as the one who has spilled his blood for their forgiveness. So they're saved. He's speaking from the economy of God. And so every saved person, so let's make sure we get this right. God prunes us because we are already his redeemed people. He doesn't prune us to be better people. He doesn't prune us so that we can become his people. He is pruning us because we are already in Christ. And the purpose of the pruning is to bring forth in an increasing way the revelation of Christ who lives in us and in whom we dwell. Correct? So that's the meaning. It's a cleaning work. It's not a punishment work. We have to make sure we get that. It's not punishment. So this morning, this is the question we'll look at. What is God's motive for cleaning? Why does God want to do this? And Jesus, remember, answers that question in John 13 in the same chapter that he is discussing the washing of his feet. And this is what he says. In other words, he said, everything I'm going to do right now in this room has one motive. And in John 13, verse 1, Jesus said, the word says, Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And because he loved them to the end, he got up from supper, laid aside his garments and taken the towel. He girded himself. And remember, he washed them. He washed their feet because he had already said, all of you are already clean by the word that I've spoken to you. So I am cleaning you because you are right now my branches and I am purifying you or I am removing from you all the impurities that would in any way inhibit the manifestation of my own life. So pruning, you remember, is the removal of anything that would inhibit in any way, even compete with the revelation of Jesus in us. So we must make sure we get that. And so why does God do it? Because he loves us. God prunes us or he washes our feet because those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Remember in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Now this is so essential, so important. Because what gets in our way when we are being pruned? When something happens in our life that we don't like. When some circumstance occurs that is in our own minds difficult and bad. And so in the midst of all this stuff in life, God is at work ministering all the episodes and all the experiences and all the relationships in us. He is constantly at work like the potter working the clay, remember, and forming it into a vessel in which the treasure of his son lives. And he is pruning and he is removing and he is doing all of this so that we are those in whom Jesus is manifested more greatly. Now, what is the verse I just kind of summarized there? You could say Romans 8, 28. Remember what he says? There are a couple of ways of uh, in, uh, um, translating this, but the way I think is better is this. For those, <laughs> for we know that God, if I start wrong, I'm not going to get it. For we know that God, that God works all things together for the good. For what's good? The revelation of Jesus. For we know that God works all things in your life. You remember that thing that happened the other day that you were so upset about? You remember that what someone said to you that really offended you? The re you, you, you remember those circumstances? God is at work using those as pruning activities so we are more and more 
looking to him, being disconnected from our dependence and love of our flesh, of our selfishness of this world, and causing our eyes to be more and more on Jesus, causing us to be more and more clean of the corruption of this fallen body, of our thoughts and of our motives, so that the revelation of his son may be manifested in us. So what is God's purpose? Why does God prune you? Why? Because he loves you. Now, that's significantly important. Why? Because if we don't see that in every circumstance, we are not going to be able to experience the joy and the peace of being pruned. We're not going to literally cooperate as effectively and as well with God's work of pruning us. Because let's remember this. Whether we like it or not or cooperate with it or not, God is going to do what? Prune us. How many of you, even when your children don't like it, you have to discipline them? And you hope one thing. That they don't see your discipline as a punitive. You know what punitive means? You're punishing them because they're angry with you. And there's something wrong with you. And they're trying to teach you something and whatever. And that's too often the way parents discipline their children. You know, I've often said to parents, when your child is misbehaving, unless it's an emergency, and you are angry, step away. Step away. I've given this example before. Years ago, Jean and I and Ashley, our daughter, were sitting at the dinner table together. Ashley was what, you think, 13, 14, somewhere around there? And we were chit-chatting. I don't remember the circumstance or the content. But Ashley said something lippy. Do you know what I mean by lippy? She gave me some lip. Now, that is a real touch for me because of the way I was raised and so on and the place how I was raised and how I was treated as a child and when she said that it in me became hmm have any of your children ever produced in you a real anger have any of us only a few of us it's astounding yes we have Dane, I was angry, brother. I was angry. She was wrong, Sarah, in saying what she did. But Donnie, I was angry. She was disrespectful. She was demeaning. She was not, she was not doing what she should have been doing. So what should I have done? She needs to be disciplined. She needs to be shown that that's not the way a child relates to his or her parent. Correct? That's the discipline. So what did I do? Steve, I was was boiling. I really was. I was, you know, Linda, it took my breath away. I mean this. I'm not exaggerating. So here's what I did. She said it. I stood up. I walked out the front door and left the house. And Gene and Ashley are looking at one another like, what's this? What, 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 what happened? Mm. Where did daddy go? Mm. He went outside. <laughs> and Michael, you, do you know why I went outside? Precisely. I had to what? Calm down. See, Todd, had I done anything toward in any way of disciplining disciplining her at that moment, I would have harmed her. Not physically, maybe. But I would have harmed it. So when I came back and sat down and, hey, what what happened? Why would you leave? Now, you're a major, right, in the Marines, Right? Why did you not discipline me? Why did you leave? 
And I said, I left for your protection. Do you understand that? Did you hear me? I left for your protection. The discipline that I needed to carry out had to be done within the context, not of me. Me. Jack, you've insulted me. I'm the daddy. I'm put off by that. I'm upset. Bogdan, I'm upset. I had to get away from that, Renee. I had to get away from it to calm down to see that the discipline she needed was for her benefit, was for her blessing. Does that make sense to you? Why did I discipline my daughter? Because I love my daughter. Why does God discipline us? Because he loves us. God never disciplines us because he is angry, put out, can't believe it, frustrated. He never, ever disciplines us on the same basis and for the same reason that we discipline others. You see, the issue at that dinner table that night even though her words were directed toward me, it wasn't about me. Are you listening? It wasn't about me, Ronnie. Joseph, it wasn't about me. Well, she certainly said it to you. Right, Daniel? She said it to you, brother. Charlie, it's not about me. Essentially, whom was her insult, to whom was her insult essentially directed? To whom? To God. It wasn't about me. And once I calmed down for being too much about me, I could come back in the room and hopefully explain, this is about God. This is about God. Every time God prunes us, he is saying, you are my child. I love you. And I simply am not going to allow you to live in a way that you are demeaning my holiness, my glory. It's about God. Now, how many of you have ever felt or were ever afraid that when you were corrected by God, that meant God didn't love you? There's only about four of you who felt that? Come on, come on. How many of us felt this? Sure. Oh, let's say it this way. How many of your children have felt that you didn't love them when you disciplined them? I mean... I, I was going to say, forgive me for using my family as an example, but no, Patrick, I want to use my family as an example. My daughter was a wonderfully obedient daughter, but I'm going to give you two examples of disobedience. You're going to think, oh, my word, what kind of a person was Ashley? So for some reason, I had to send Ashley to her room. She'd done something. Go to your room. <laughs> She goes to the room, shuts the door. Huh. Huh. Is that communicating something? Ah, how many of us? Huh. God. Come on, come on. Are we awake this morning? How many of us with our attitude of what's happening, whatever? Huh. Why? Huh. Cody, you hear that? Huh. Todd, you hear that? You and your tribe back there, good to see all of you. So wonderful to see the Lowe's and the Tuckers together back there. And then half, half of them up here and then Charlie the Meshes. I didn't say mess, mesh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
So Jackie, she went, I mean, Claudia. She went, hmm. Now, what do I do? Because, you see, Jody, that hmm was an insult. It was, you know, disrespect. Now, whether or not she did it, I know what's going through her mind. Because believe it or not, you're not going to believe this, Celeste. At one time, I was a child. <laughs> huh? You don't believe it? <laughs> you dirty old. So, <laughs> to you. Hey, look. So I went in her room. She's blowed up like a woodpecker. Some of you know what that, you ever heard that before? She is. And I said, Do you love daddy? I said, Daddy loves you. I said, So I want you to say, Dad, I love you. I see y'all looking at one another over there. Your mama didn't see that, but I saw it. Don't, don't, don't look at him, mama. <laughs> Finally, she says, I love you. Okay, fair. I took that, you know. Then I left the room. Why did I do that? Why? Because if she isn't at least cognitively, mentally, knowledgeable that I love her at least this way maybe not feeling it at the moment she don't feel nothing but anger right now if she is mentally remembering that your dad loves you when not if when not if when the enemy comes a knocking and says you see what is he going to say Tiffany dad doesn't what you can speak, Tiff. Go ahead. Dad, Dad doesn't love you. Okay, so it was a difficult class. There she goes. How many know that's going to happen in her heart? Come on. You can, let's have class participation. The devil is going to say, Dad doesn't love you. You don't have to bet on it. It's a sure fact. Because he cometh not but to kill, steal, and destroy from the people of God. John 10, 10. And by confessing that, at least from my way, from my ability... I was hoping that her confession at least would ameliorate. You know what ameliorate means? Soften. The, the suggestion and the temptation that dad doesn't love you. Oh, you with me today? Do you recognize in yourself and even in those whom you know that when we are pruned by God how often we have these feelings are you with me today on this it is imperative that we know That God has never, nor will ever, cease to love us. Now, someone tell me the Bible verse that explains how I know that. It's very simple. Three different three words. First John 4, verse 8 or verse 16. Why do we know God loves us? Why do we know that even when we're miserable, God still loves us? Why do we know that? Bex, do you know why? Because what? God is love. Remember, we've studied that, the attributes of God. 
That means this, that God cannot. Let me say it double negative. God cannot not love us in every single aspect or moment or event in our lives. Why? Because he has saved us to be his children. Do we get this? It is incompatible to the very being of God to have his love for us to be affected, diminished, even to the very slightest based on what we do. Are you listening to me this morning? You remember that incredible, breathtaking statement that Jesus made in John 17, 26, and I'm assuming all of you know it. Jesus is talking about the unity, and at the end of the prayer, he says, Father, I pray that the love that you have for me, and reciprocally that he has for the Father, I pray that this love, this same love that is among the persons of the Trinity, the same love is now where? Deposited in us. And if God's love for us at any one moment for any particular reason is in any way altered that means that the Father's love for the Son is also what? Altered. And do you believe that? How many of us believe that the Father's love of the Son, the Son's love for the Father is absolutely unalterable? Absolutely. That same love is where? Where is it if you're a believer? Where is it, Linda? In me. The problem is we look at ourselves and our circumstances and our own feelings too often, I'm sorry, too closely and not look up, if you would, using a spatial image. <laughs> this is absolutely mind-boggling and unbelievable to the extent that our minds will say, are you sure about that? I'm not sure about I don't. You see, is it true, though? Is there any variation of the love of God among the three persons of the Trinity? Is there any variation? Todd, is there? Can't hear you, brother. No, no never. That same love. Nathan, may I repeat that word? That what? Same. Please get this down, Pam. That what? Same love. Carrie, the same love. The same intensity, the same zeal, the same continuance. Is now residential in us. Romans 5, 5. If you don't know it, write it down, for goodness sakes. Romans 5, 5. For the love of God. That means the love within God about himself. Among the three persons. That love. For the love of God has been what? Shed abroad or poured out. For the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So the next time you and I, God, oh, I'm not whom and God, I would just, whom the circumstance. Well, come on, let's be real. You whom and God, Pharaoh. The next time that happens, Lisa, remember this. 
God loves you. The Father loves you with the same intensity, with the same love that he loves his own son. And if that doesn't begin to break down your attitude and open your heart to the pruning work of the Holy Spirit, ain't nothing's going to do it. And I would even dare to say you're not a believer. There's a lot more I said about love in your notes, but do we understand this? Can we? Yes, we can. It's will we. You see, our words mean something. Can we do? Yes, certainly you can. Will you, will I, will we leave here today? And I need to hear, Gene would tell you, I hope you're listening to yourself. I am, I am. I am my biggest audience here. Will we leave here today asking God, Holy Spirit, cause me to be continually conscious and continually testifying, stating that you love me the same as you love the Lord Jesus. And that whatever I'm going through, in some way, you are using to accentuate, develop, grow, manifest, flower this awesome love of God that is in us. Pruning. The second, third question in your notes, do you see it? What does it say? What's the third question there? Is that another question? Hmm? How what? Start again. Our need to be pruned. Well, I'm going to say it this way. Our need to be pruned is the same need that we had to be saved. How needy were we to be saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. There was nothing in us or about us that could have affected our own salvation. That need still exists in me even though we are now saved and have the Holy Spirit. You remember Jesus, his words in John chapter 5 verse 30, that's a significant verse. John 5 30, it may be in your notes, I'm not sure. Jesus says this. Now listen to this. This is, this is Jesus Christ himself. He says, I can do. I didn't hear the word. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. One more time. I can't hear you. Nothing. I can do nothing. What does nothing mean? When Jesus says nothing, Jackie, what does he mean by nothing? Nada. Ain't nothing. Not, not most not just a little bit, but totally, completely, and absolutely, I am devoid of any ability in myself. I can do nothing of my own, what's the rest of the sentence? Initiative, work. Jesus needed the presence of the Holy Spirit to lead him, to give him the right words, the wisdom, the discernment that the Father wanted him to have. He did not have it intrinsically in his humanity. Do you know what I mean by that? As a man, he was as weak and unable to affect the work of God as we are. You see, he didn't come here a superhuman man. And he had to live 100% perfectly dependent upon, if you would, the pruning work of God in him. Using it, not about sin, but when Jesus 
encountered difficulty, the Holy Spirit gave him the discernment of how to answer. The Holy Spirit gave him the motive why to answer. The Holy Spirit did all that was necessary in him so that as he reacted to any particular circumstance, his heavenly Father, our God, was being manifested in him. Remember, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. Remember where that is? John 14, 9. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If Jesus needed the constant ministry of the Holy Spirit, can any of us say we're not in absolute total need? So here's one of the difficulties that we have as believers. There's something in us that we think we can do something good and laudable for God. Can we on our own? We need the Holy Spirit. So let's remember this as we leave this morning. Every one of us are going to be pruned. Does anybody recognize right now you're in a pruning a time? Anybody in a pruning season? Anyone at all? You're being pruned? Well, you may not raise your hand, but you don't know it. You're being pruned. You see, Jacob, you are ever being pruned. It doesn't cease, brother. Why? Because we need it 100%. Therefore, it's happening 100%. Do we see that? We think of pruning only when this and that happen. But otherwise, hey, I'm coasting. They ain't happening. Carolyn, you are being pruned every moment because you need it every moment. Do we see that? Pruning is an unceasing work until Jesus returns or we go to be with him. Now, we don't think that way, do we? We only think of those bad things that happen and God is now pruning me. Nope. All the time. We leave, hey, Karen, we need to be pruned. We need to ask to be pruned. We need to remember that pruning is the loving, Father's loving removal of anything that in any way interferes with or distorts the very person of Jesus. Why does God prune us? Because he loves us. How much does he love us? As much as he loves Jesus. How long will he love us? As long as he loves Jesus. Correct? Did we get that? Hopefully that will help us. Next week will be the final week of this um, series. Okay. Then September 10th, we'll have a breakfast together in here. Next week, September 3rd, will be our final meeting of this series and then we'll have a breakfast on September 10th. You got it? Because I know there have been some question about that. Okay. Thank you so much for being here.